Well, good evening, Paradigm. My name is Chad. If you have a copy of God's Word, why don't you find the book of John, Gospel of John. It's going to be in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, uh, you'll go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. John chapter 4 is where we're going to be at tonight. And man, I'm so excited. You braved the cold. It's only going to get colder. And so hopefully you got some warm weather gear ready to go. And for a Texas guy, man, this I'm not used to this, man. It's about to get, I mean, like bone cold is what we say down south. And so um, I'm glad you're here and we're going to be warm and we're going to be excited about what God's going to teach us tonight. And then we'll be prepared to hit it tomorrow. <clears throat> well, I remember the first time that um, I, I sucked gasoline through a water hose. Um, I was 17. I know you remember the first time you did that too. Um, I was 17 and my dad, um, he, he, he woke me up the next morning. We were supposed to go run some errands together, go work on, on my Jeep actually. And um, he woke me up. He said, hey, Chad, I really don't remember how I got home last night. Night, which wasn't so odd for him to say, um, but he said, so I, I just kind of remember uh, waking up this morning, and so we hop in his truck, and he drove like one of those really big trucks, the, like the one-ton dually, you know what I'm talking about, two gas tanks on it, and so we get in the truck, and he flips the switch and realizes both gas tanks are on E, and so he's like, I don't even know how I got here. And so we run to the gas station. He fills up both tanks full of fuel. And, uh, and then we, we head on down the road to take care of the business we were going to take care of on that Saturday morning. Well, we don't get like five miles down the road. And my dad's truck begins to kind of like pitter-patter and shake a little bit. And he realizes that something's wrong. So we pull over at another gas station. Uh, we get out. We do some investigation. Realize that he has filled up both gas tanks with gasoline, uh, which is usually not a problem if your engine takes gasoline. Uh, this was a diesel engine. And so uh, it didn't operate properly. Uh, but my dad's probably like some of y'all or some of your dads, like doesn't waste anything. And so what he does is he hops on the phone, uh, calls my brother's. Uh, we were all in high school together, so we're that close in age. So we were all driving, but just like balling on the budget, you know what I'm saying? Remember those $10 get you down the road days, you know what I'm talking about? And so we were always rolling like quarter of a tank or less in the gas tank. And so he calls my brothers and he says, hey, bring a couple of gas cans, bring your cars, and bring a water hose. And so I'm like, gas can, got it, cars, why do we need a water hose? So they get there and he proceeds to cut the water hose, stick it in the gas can, and then hand it to me me and say, hey, do you know how to siphon uh, things? And I'm like, I, I'm not real sure what you're asking me. Because it seems like you're asking me to huff gasoline, and I'm not down with that, and so I'm not a good idea. But anyway, so we then proceed to siphon the gasoline out of the gas tank, which was really a diesel tank. And here's what I learned that night, I mean, that morning. Um, you need to put the right fuel in, in your tank, right? And, and your engine in your car, newsflash, it requires a certain type of fuel in order to operate properly. And if you put the wrong fuel in your tank and it gets into your engine, it's going to go bad, all right? And so I start there uh, tonight because your heart is like an engine. It's like the engine of your body. And in your heart, it requires a certain fuel if it's going to operate in the way that it was created to operate. And let me be real clear tonight. The fuel in which your heart was meant to operate the best on is the fuel of the worship of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, he literally formed and fashioned your heart inside of your mother's womb. He just made it inside of there. It's kind of cool how he does that. And he brought it together, and then when that heart began to beat, it began to beat to the glory of God. And so when we join the, the way that we were created and we align our lives with the Creator, we begin to rise up to the, to the reason and to the existence of our creation. And so tonight, I want to call you uh, to, to join me in this revolution called the Jesus Revolution, the irresistible revolution that swept planet Earth 2,000 years ago when Jesus stepped down in time and he lived a sinless life but then died on a cross and then rose from the grave and ushered in this great movement we call the church. And what has been marked by, or what has marked the church is that they have lived lives of worship. And listen, worship, get this out of your mind that worship is just what we did earlier. Okay, I mean, that, that is worship, but, but it's not limited to just that. And so worship isn't just something that you do a couple of hours a week, maybe Tuesdays and Sundays. Worship is, it's a way of life. And so I want to invite you maybe even to change your paradigm when it comes to worship and when it comes to church and when it comes to what is going to fulfill you ultimately. And I want, you to, I want to invite you into tonight, and I want you to see that, that we're going to talk about the fuel of the revolution. That's what I've titled this message, the fuel of the revolution. And I want you to see that worship is in savoring God. Worship is in sacrificing for God. And worship is in singing to God. 
Point number one, if you're taking notes tonight, why don't you write this down? Worship is in savoring. Worship is in savoring. So John chapter four, uh, Jesus is um, having this conversation with this woman. And, and the way that they meet is a little bit odd. There's a, a lot of cultural tensions around him meeting this woman. So if you, you know much about the history, there's this old school racism that exists in the Middle East between uh, the Samaritans and the Jews. And this woman was a Samaritan. And then there was a lot of um, uh, sexist that took place back in the day. And so typically uh, women didn't talk to men. And then especially not at high noon. And so this woman, we could just say she was a woman of the street, all right? And she goes up to this well because she's thirsty in more ways than one, all right? And then Jesus begins to strike up a conversation with her. And Jesus begins to tell her, hey, like he says, say girl, maybe not in that language, but he says, say girl, could you get me something to drink? And uh, she's like, why are you talking to me? She's a little bit confused. And then he says, well, if you knew who was talking to you, then you would ask for a drink that would satisfy every longing that's inside of your heart. And she's like, okay, I'm listening, right? And then he begins to say, okay, well, go call your husband. And that's where we pick up in the text. John 4, start here in verse 16. Jesus said to her, it's about to get awkward, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I don't, I don't have a husband. He said, uh, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have five husbands. Bum, 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 right? And the one whom you're now, uh, the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. That Jesus is, ha listen, Jesus is savage, y'all, all right? I'm telling you, you may have come in here tonight expecting like, like baby farts and pumpkin spice and pixely dust and all that stuff, just feeling good and it's something cute and light, but Jesus don't operate that way. If you're gonna have a collision with the creator of your heart, he's gonna go after your heart relentlessly. And that's what he's doing here with this woman. He's like, hey, I wanna give you, I wanna give you this living water that you'll never thirst again. And she's like, okay, tell me, tell me. He's like, but first, we gotta do, we've gotta do some work on you, girl, all right? And so he calls out some of her things, and he's calling out some of those things that she has decided to feast upon. He's calling out some of those false fuels that she's put inside of her heart, thinking that she'll get fulfillment. And listen, she had fueled her heart with sex and relationships, and she was breaking down. And maybe that's you here tonight. Like, like maybe you've come here tonight, and if you're being honest, which I know it's a church, and I know that's hard to do at, at church, right? Uh, but if you're being honest with yourself, maybe you've come in here tonight, and you're feeling that sense of like, you're just kind of getting by in life. Like, or maybe you've even come, if you'd be so honest, and you are, you are broke down. Or, or maybe like you know the Lord, like the, you, you've tarried with the Lord, that's how we say in the church, you've walked with him for some time, but if you're being honest, like you're rolling on fumes tonight. Like your spiritual gas tank is on E. And that's where this woman was here tonight. And maybe the reason why you might be in that place tonight is because you are not receiving the proper fuel for your heart or you're chasing false fuels trying to find fulfillment for your heart. And so, I, I mean, we do this, we're, we're, we're natural uh, just, like idol making factories inside of our heart. Like we run after all these things thinking that they're gonna find fulfillment. And so one of the things that we run after is the stuff, right? Like we just, we, we like, you know, you had a great Christmas maybe. Uh, you got some coin for, you know, we're in that age group where you don't, want, you don't want things, you just want gift cards and envelopes for Christmas, right? And so you can go like invest it or go spend it down at the plaza. You can get a new outfit. We like new cars, amen? Nobody like a new car up in here? Like, come on, man. Like the smell of a new car, the sound of a new car. I love a new car. I love new shoes. I, lo I love new boots. I love to wear new boots and then pull them off, and there's kind of that moist, humid, because my feet sweat, and I just love to just breathe it in. Oh, it's like glorious, the leather smell mixed with my foot sweat. It's amazing. It's like, a, you know, essential oils, but different, right? <laughs> And so I, I love new things, and, and listen, you do too. And here's what a lot of us think in, in the room tonight, that if we get that new thing, that new house, the new job, the new guy, the new girl, the new whatever, the new iPhone, whatever it is, then we will be satisfied. And so we chase new after new after new, and listen, new and nice is nice, but it will never satisfy you. And all the things that you are collecting and all the things that you think are awesome is gonna be someone's awesome deal on Facebook Marketplace sometime. And maybe you got that great outfit, but it's just gonna be the outfit that the girl brags about that she bought on Poshmark, all right? And so the stuff that we accrue is gonna be sold in an estate sale someday. 
And so it's not going to satisfy you. And so uh, uh, others of us, we run after like sex and relationships, right? And when are we going to learn? <laughs> when, when are we going to learn that cheap sex is always costly? Th that pornography is not an antidote to our desires. And so the paint is still drying on the porn industry, but what they are finding is that it is unraveling our generation's ability to find true intimacy. And some of you are here, you don't believe this, and you are undermining the glory and the, the euphoria and the bliss of your marriage because of the decisions you're making sexually. And some of you are like, well, Chad, I, I'm, I'm not even engaged. I don't even have a girlfriend. My point exactly, because you're only becoming more of who you are today. And if you abused sex and you chase it in inappropriate ways, it is going to undermine your pleasure all the while you're trying to find it. Or, or, or you think that a person's going to satisfy you. That's this woman in John 4. And so we have codependent relationship after codependent. And you can't imagine your life apart from him or apart from her. Listen, if you, are, if you cannot imagine your life apart from someone, you are putting them on a pedestal that they were never meant to be on. And the weight of your reliability upon them, that you rely on them, you lean on them, is going to crush them, and they are going to disappoint you. Or maybe it's not stuff, maybe it's not sex and relationships, maybe it's just you, right? I mean, this is the time where you're asking yourself the question, what do I need to improve about myself? And what do I need to do to make me better? Listen, those aren't bad questions. You should do the keto. You should do intermittent fasting. You should get on the workout plan. You, yes, that is great. And it's not wrong to improve yourself, but it is wrong to live for yourself. And so watch yourself because is your conversation just revolving around you? And so like we're, we're a few days in. I think we're like 29 days in. And, uh, and, and all you've talked about the last 29 days is, is your victories and your defeats on your diet or on your workout plan. And that just seems to be the, 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 the narrative that has been your 2019. And I think the height of our selfishness revolves around, we just want things to be convenient, right? And, and, and really, this was demonstrated this last week, that, that the, the pinnacle of us chasing convenience and, and chasing self, listen, that is a slippery slope into a gross darkness that our nation celebrates. One of the virtues in America is autonomy, is individuality, that you get to do whatever you want to do as long as it doesn't hurt someone unless it's an abortion. And so in New York, like they painted the World Trade Center pink with light and people celebrated the fact that we passed a law in one of our most influential states that it's okay to kill your child a day before you deliver that child. And so in New York, you can lethally inject the innocent baby in your womb, but let us not lethally inject a rapist or a serial killer in New York. And if we can open our eyes, we can see that our nation is filling its heart, the heart of the nation, with all of these false fuels that are causing us to break down. And we need a revolution paradigm. And we need a heart change. And that starts not with them, but with us right here. And the fuel for the revolution is worship. I wonder, what are you putting in your heart? I wonder tonight, what is the fuel for your fulfillment? Another way of saying it in the church is, what do you worship? And worship is the fuel for the revolution. And if you want to worship Christ, you got to worship him in savoring him. Uh, savoring Jesus, savoring Christ, that's not really something we talk a lot about in the church, unfortunately. But did you know that we are commanded by God to enjoy him? Psalm 34, 8 says this, you could note this, that it, it literally says to, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love that. Oh, you know, it's not like, uh, oh, no, oh, it's like, oh, taste it. I mean, you got to try this. So if you were to have lunch at my house today, my wife cooked it and hooked it up, all right? We had smoked brisket, tacos, fresh made pico, fresh made guaco. It was awesome, right? And so I come home, she has, she has shred that Tillamook block cheese, which is the best way with the best cheese. We smoked the brisket. She put it all together with some frijoles negros. That's black beans for those of y'all who don't speak Spanish. She pulled it all together. Now, when you look at it, it don't look all that good, right? I mean, it's like some like bark brisket with, I mean, it's colorful, but I don't know. But as soon as you lay your teeth in it, and when you taste and see, you're gonna be like, mmm, that's good. And listen, God is entreating all of you tonight. Oh, taste and see. This is a command, not a suggestion. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You've got to experience it. 
and so many of us are content with experiencing God through someone else. And so it's like going out to eat with someone and sitting there and watching them enjoy their meal and you're content with saying, hey, just tell me how good it is. <laughs> is it good? Yeah, bro, it is, mm, yeah. What if, what's, this, what's it taste like? Oh man, it's, you, you can't even explain it. You got some grease running down your chin, bro. Oh, I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna just soak that up. Tell me more. And you wanna experience Jesus that way. He's like, bro, you don't have to have secondhand Holy Spirit. You can get him firsthand, come. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Elsewhere he commands us. In Psalm 37, he says this, delight yourself in the Lord. Not a suggestion, a commandment. Delight yourself in the Lord. I wonder, is that your experience with God? When somebody says, hey bro, how's your walk doing? That's how we say it in the church. Like, how's your relationship with Jesus? We say, how's your walk doing? How's your walk? Do you say, delightful? Probably not. How's your walk, bro? It's delicious. Do you use adjectives of savoring and enjoying God to describe your relationship with him? Do you enjoy God? Listen, the more gladness you have in God, the better. That God is the genesis of joy, and he's the genius of joy. And so why would we be so surprised that God says, hey, come to me and find joy, that the fuel for your fulfillment is in the enjoyment of God? And when we worship God, listen, we are savoring him, and we are reflecting back to God the radiance of his worth. John Piper, he famously says it like this, that the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. That God is entreating all of us tonight to enjoy him. So this, uh, this last weekend, I had the chance to take my wife out on a date, and uh, we, we love to compete against one another, and so sometimes that, that's good, sometimes that's bad, but in this particular time, I dominated, so it was all good. She let me win. And so we went to main event, holla at your boy, okay, main event people, all right. Anyway, and so we went to main event, we were ski balling, like, you so fine. <laughs> I'm going to get 100, all right, you know, and, uh, and then we basketball, I mean, all the games, and, uh, and then we shot pool. It was cool, man. We had a great time, and I want you to imagine that you had kind of like a backseat uh, a perspective once we got in the truck. I want you to imagine that we got in the truck, and, and she looked over at me, and she said, Chad, I had a blast. Thank you so much for taking me on a date. I want you to imagine that I looked at her and said, it was my duty to entertain you. You've been like, oh, no, he didn't. Mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no, he didn't. And what would that show of my love for her? As opposed to us getting in the truck and, and she said, Chad, I had such a great time. Thank you so much for taking me on a date. And I grabbed her by the hand and said, baby, you are my woman. You are my lady. I had such a great time with you because, listen, I enjoy you. And you'd be like, oh, I need to get out of here, right? Listen, what brings more glory, what brings more beauty in my relationship with my wife when I enjoy her or when I endure her? And so many of you, when you think about your relationship with Christ, it's kind of like this dutiful worship of God. And listen, God does not want your begrudging, dutiful worship of him. He is entreating all of us here tonight to taste and see his goodness and to delight in him, that that's what God wants for the people of God. But in order to savor him and enjoy him, we, we got to have the right combo because uh, we can't just approach this. And Jesus actually gives us some help. He says, hey, I want you to love me. I want you to enjoy me, but, but I'm going to give you some help. Here's how, here's how you do it. So what happened in this story in John 4, Jesus has just called this woman out, and she does what a lot of us do in that situation, just change the subject, right? Okay, yeah, um, you're right. Um, that's awkward. Let's talk about something else. And so she changes the subject over to, to worship, and she begins to ask him some questions about worship and kind of one of these things that have been like a longstanding debate between their people. And, and then Jesus, he, he inserts some profound truth. And so if you're in John 4, uh, verse 23, I want to point your attention to this. And, and if you're looking for a memory verse, there's one coming up, and it's a a great text for you to understand the heart of God and what he wants for you as a believer in God if you are one. And here's what it says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, in spirit and truth. That's the combo. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. 
Verse 24, here's the memory verse. God is spirit. It's telling us something about God. He everywhere. What is that? He everywhere. You know what I'm saying? God is spirit, all right? He's everywhere. God is spirit, and those who worship him must, okay, here it is, not a suggestion, Jesus, Jesus the life, the, um, the lips of our Savior, of our front runner, excuse me, that was my middle school moment, <clears throat> all right, I'm back. Anyway, those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Somebody say spirit. spirit. Somebody say truth. That's the combo, if you want to save your God, spirit and in truth. Listen, spirit, that's that emotional, that intimate aspect of worship. That, that's where we say in the church when you went like, oh, that's my song, man, I'm just feeling it, right? That's when your hands raise, you just, you know, just snotty you know, you loving Jesus, right, in that moment. You, you're showing it. That's the spirit. You're feeling it. All right? The truth, that's like the systematic theology. Uh, that's like the Bible study, like deep contemplative. I like to mind the depths of doctrine. I like to read people like Spurgeon and Hodges and MacArthur and Luther and blah, 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 like all that kind of stuff, you know. And that's the truth piece. And what Jesus says is that you've got to have the intimacy and you've got to have the information. You've got to have the spirit and you've got to have the truth. And, but the problem is, is that a lot of us have come here tonight and when it comes to worship, like we got the spirit down. Like we love the spiritual aspect of it. And actually this is a growing notion in our in our world today, that it's all about the spirit. It's all about the spirit, but Jesus says, no, 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 if you don't worship me, you gotta have the combo right, spirit and truth. And so we have a lot of people that they just kinda err in the side of spirit. So I want you to imagine that you're, again, you're watching the date that I was on Saturday with my wife, and, and we're shooting pool, and I, and I take a moment where, where I just kind of grab her by the shoulders, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm like, all right, here's my, here's my, like, affirming moment, right, where I grab my woman by the shoulders, I look at her in the eyes, and I just tell her who she is to me, okay? So I want you to imagine that you're there, you're watching this, and, and I grab her by the shoulders, and I'm like, Chelsea, you are amazing. Like, you are the woman of my dreams, and your blonde hair it just, I just want to smell it, and it's just like a flock of angelic spaghetti coming off your head, and your brown eyes, oh my goodness, brown-eyed lover on the other side of town, Alan Stone said, and that's you, like you're, that's my, you're on the, you're just here, oh my goodness, and you were like, you know, some of y'all be like, oh, that is so sweet, I wish my man would talk to me, unless you knew Chelsea, because Chelsea has not blonde hair, but brown hair, she has not brown eyes, but green eyes. You say, bro, you had the right heart. You, you had the right heart, bro. I didn't even take it that way. It was romantic. It was shoulders, moment, eye contact. But you didn't have the facts right. And a lot of you, you come here and you worship like with, I mean, intense. You are intimate with the Father, but you're ignorant to the Father. You have the right spirit, but you don't know God. You don't know the person you're worshiping. You're just feeling it. And Jesus says, you got to have the right combo if you're going to savor me. And so you got to have spirit and truth. Others of you, you just, you err more on the side of truth. You're like, man, I want Bible study. I want doctrine. I want sermon after sermon. I want podcast. I want, it. I want the truth. And it's the same as if you were in that moment. I grab Chelsea by the shoulders and I say, Chelsea, this is my moment for me to honor you. You have brown curly hair. You have green eyes. You are my wife. I love you. Okay, let's shoot some more pool. You'd be like, okay, all right, bro, you got all the facts right. But can I get a little bit more juice in that, you know? And, and listen, a lot of you, you have the facts right. You have all the right doctrine, but your worship is dead. Like you know God, but you don't love him. And Jesus is saying you gotta have the right combo. If you wanna savor me, you gotta have spirit and you gotta have truth. And this is the type of worship that God is seeking. You gotta combine the two. And last, the way you savor God, the way you worship him, and it, it's savoring. You savor him through enjoying him, through connecting these two truths, and then you, you worship him and savoring through connecting the dots. And, and the dots I'm talking about, you got to connect these dots. See, I think a lot of us, we come in here tonight, and, and we would recognize God as our creator. You know, like, like you, you probably have some belief that there is a God out there, that he created things, and and, and, and we live our life kind of as functional deist. And what I mean by that is that we believe that there's a creator, but, but he really kind of operates separate from our life. And so we, we acknowledge there's a creator, and we really only call out to him when we need something. And so you have the creator over here, and then all the while, the majority of our life, um, we're just experiencing the creation. And the creation, you know, this is like your, your schooling, this is your job, this is your love life, uh, this is ice cream. 
okay? Um, this is coffee, uh, this is colors, uh, this is conversations, this is smells, this is sunsets and sunrises, this is the creation. And, and functionally, we operate like this. The, the, we've got the creator over there, and like, that's cool, like, I appreciate you setting all of this in motion, and I'm just gonna be over here, and what the book of Romans says is that, that the wrath of God is poured out upon those who darkened their heart towards the creator, they begin to worship the creation, they begin to elevate the creation over the creator, and they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And, and listen, what, what I'm trying to implore you to do tonight is to connect the dots. And when you connect the dots that the creation was given to you for your enjoyment, okay? God does not want you not to eat ice cream or drink coffee or have sex inside of marriage or any of those things, okay? But God wants you to connect the creation to the creator. And when you connect the creation to the creator and you begin to enjoy the creation and you tell God about it and the creation becomes a means to the end of worshiping the creator, when you combine the creation and the creator, you connect the dots that all that God made was so that you would enjoy what he made and that you would enjoy him ultimately. This is what it means to worship. That God wants you to connect the dots. I don't know if you're connecting the dots. Let me explain it this way, okay? Um, I love my, my go-to drink. I love it. Some of y'all have heard about this before, but every morning just about, we make two shots of espresso and then we get this Chateau chocolate milk. Any Chateau chocolate milk people? Thank you, Jesus, all right? Thank you. All right, this is so good, you can tell. Anyway, and so I love Chateau chocolate milk, and we combine these things. My favorite espresso drink is a Cortado, but we make it with chocolate milk, and it's called a Chocolatado, but it's a Chateau Chocolatado is what we call it on our menu in our home. And when I think about all that went in to create the Chateau Chocolatado, it just blows my mind. And listen, God has given you uh, so many things to enjoy and experience that you just breeze on by and you never contemplate the creativity that went into that thing for your enjoyment. And so you think about a coffee bean, like I get maybe something from Rwanda, I don't know, or Ethiopia, it comes over here, you cook it to the, you just burn the bean, then you grind it, but something in that grind begins to activate my nose, and my nose senses is connected to my tongue. And so when I smell the coffee beans grinding, my tongue begins to salivate in anticipation of my chocolatado. And then you think about a cow, that's disgusting, but chocolate milk comes from that cow. You know, you, and all this comes together, you put the ground coffee beans, the right, the right amount of water pressure, the steamed chocolate milk, chocolatado. And listen, that doesn't preserve my life. Like if I'm stranded on an island, I'm not thinking, you know what, if I had a chocolatado right now, we would make it. <laughs> no. That this drink, what is its purpose other than pleasure in my life? And so many of us, we experience the glorious riches of God's creation, but we never leverage that and we never connect the creation to the creator. So here's what I've learned to do. I've learned to sip my chocolatado and enjoy it, but tell God about how good he is for making that coffee bean, for roasting it or growing it in Rwanda or Ethiopia or wherever, bringing it here, getting all those cattle up north of the river and getting the Chateau chocolate milk farm on point, getting me all of that, and then allowing me to sip it in the confines of my warm home in the midst of the loving family that he's placed me in so that I would enjoy what he's made and tell him. And this is what it means to savor God. You've got to connect the dots. You've got to enjoy him. What are the things in your life that you are experiencing but you're not leveraging to worship Jesus? Why do you think God gave you sex? Why do you think God gave you relationships? Why do you think God gave you ice cream? Why do you think God gave you coffee and conversations and color? Listen, he gave it all to you so that you would enjoy those things his way and in his time. You've got to connect the dots. Listen, God wants you to experience pleasure uninhibited, but not unrestricted. Everything that God gives, he governs. And so there's a right way to experience God's gifts in creation. He wants you to experience pleasure uninhibited, but not unrestricted. And we see this play out in so many different areas. Listen, God invented sex. He patented pleasure. Why not try his ideas, his way for a change? 
and see if there's this fulfillment when you feast on the fuel that God has given you and you can begin to worship him through savoring him. The fuel of a relationship with Jesus, the the fuel of the revolution is worship. And we worship God in our savoring. Point number two is we worship God in our sacrificing. We worship God in our sacrificing, that worship is sacrificing. One of the most famous passages of scripture is Romans chapter 12. Paul, he's the greatest theologian in Christianity. And he writes these words in Romans 12 verse one. He says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. He's like, give yourself to God because of all that he's done for you. Some of your translations say, by his mercies. He says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he finds acceptable. And here's what he says, this is truly the way to worship him. Revolutionaries worship Jesus through sacrifice. Uh, The first word that, or the first time that word worship is used in the scriptures is in Genesis chapter 22 in the context of a man named Abraham who had one son, and this son, on on this son's blood and on his legacy and, and, and his posterity hinged all the promises of God. And God tells Abraham, hey, I need you to sacrifice your son. He's like, hold up. You mean do what? He's like, yeah, I need you to take your son up to Mount Moriah. I need you to kill him. He's like, oh, okay. And so he gathers everything, and he looks at his servant, and his servant's like, hey, what y'all about to do? Where's the sacrifice? And he's got his knife, his wood, and his boy, but no ram. And he just looks at his servant and says, hey, me and the boy, we're going up to the mountain to worship. And what he's saying is we're going up there to make a sacrifice. Now, spoiler alert. Abraham did not kill his son. God's not down with child sacrifice and that sort of thing. God stopped him, but here's what he wanted to see. Abraham, will you trust me with the thing that is most precious in your life? And I think most of us come in here, and maybe you have children, maybe you don't. Probably the majority of you don't have kids. And so when I think about what is the greatest thing that you could sacrifice to God, it's you. It's what Paul says, that I plead with you to give your body to God to lay your life down, that sacrifice and worship, those are linked layers in scripture. You know what I'm saying? They're always connected, they're always moving together. And so Paul calls us to sacrifice the most precious gift in our life, and that is our lives. We looked at last week that revolutionaries, they take up the cross. They deny themselves, they follow Jesus. This is the call of the revolution. They offer to God what is most precious in their life. Because listen, God cares about you more than you do. He made you. And so you're, you're wondering if you can trust what is most delicate, your heart, over to God. He's like, listen, I, I made your heart. And you can trust me with that which is most precious in your life. But what does that look like practically? Like, How do we live a life of sacrifice, right? I think we hear these sort of things at church, and we're like, all right, ready to go. And so let me just kind of give you two lanes, all right? And two lanes in regards to you thinking of a life of sacrifice. So that day, um, that my dad filled up both, both of his tanks with gas, still kind of funny. Anyway, uh, when he did that, and he thought the gas tank, the gas station had put in their diesel pump gasoline. He was so convinced that he was not wrong. He was wrong. Anyway, that day that we did that, we had to siphon out the bad fuel, and so if you want to live a life of sacrifice, that's a good picture that you've, you, you've broke down maybe, or maybe you're just kind of gimping along spiritually. It's because you have filled your heart with the wrong things. And God is calling you tonight, if you want to live a life of worship in him, you have to sacrifice the thing that is cluttering your heart. And you may need to siphon out the sin that is in your heart. I wonder, what's the bad fuel that's in your tank tonight? Uh, One of the ways we like to ask it here at Paradigm is, what is your favorite sin? What is the sin that you're trying to, or excuse me, what is the struggle that you're trying to smuggle into your relationship with Christ? Like, God, I know you love me and I know you want all of me, but can I still have him? God, I know you love me and I know you want all of me, but I'm just going to smuggle in this spending habit. God, I know you love me, I know you want all of me, but I'm just going to eat however I want. God, I know you love me, and I know that you died for me, but I'm just going to smuggle in my self-righteousness because I'm awesome. What is the sin that is in your heart that you need to siphon out of your heart? Maybe it's stuff. Maybe it's sex and relationships. Maybe it's your selfishness. What are the toxins in your tank that are causing your heart to not work properly? Maybe the reason why you are at rock bottom tonight is because you've been chasing all the wrong things. 
and what you drink from today is going to drown you tomorrow. You, you can't just chase whatever you want to chase and there no, there not be any consequences. That God is trying to work in every one of our lives and he's trying to expose and to siphon out the things that we need to get out of our heart. Maybe you're just filling your heart with stuff that's just that's, that's good stuff. Maybe it's, it is a good relationship. Maybe it is a good job. But maybe you've made it ultimate. And God is trying to say, trust me with everything about your life. I have big plans for your life. And so you need to siphon that sin out of your heart. But listen, that day when we got all that gas out of the gas tank, uh, that, that wasn't the end game for us, right? And so um, we got all the bad stuff out, but then the tanks were empty. And so what we had to do was we had to get the truck over to the next gas pump and, and put diesel in it this time. That's how it's supposed to work. And so it wasn't good enough just for us to have a clean gas tank. All right, so hear me clearly. The, the goal of Christianity is not sinlessness. The goal of Christianity, your life in Christ, is not sinlessness. It's godliness. And there's a difference. Let me explain. Sinlessness would mean that you just need to siphon out all the sin of your heart. But you'll just sit there and you will be worthless. You've got to be fueled with the right things inside of your heart. That when it comes to Christianity, it's about you naming the lie and then inserting the truth. Not just excavating the sin out of your life. You've got to put the right things in your life. And so some of you need to siphon your sin out of your heart. And that's what it looks like for you to live a life of sacrifice. But then you need to refuel your heart with the right things. And let me just be real, real practical. The, the two things that you should refuel in your heart are, are uh, reading the Bible and praying. You read the Bible. So some of you here and you're like, man, I just want to experience God's presence in my life. Listen, God is always going to back up his word. So, so read the Bible. Some of you say, well, Chad, it's kind of a big book. I don't know how to read the Bible. Well, here, here's what I do. I'll just tell you what I do. This is my experience. I'm reading the book of Psalms. I'm in Psalm 69 right now. I have a pen in hand. I usually have something to write down with and write down in. I have my Bible and I read until God has spoken to me. And so I read, and then God speaks to you. He wants to speak to you through your word. Listen, if you can figure out how to book a travel vacation to Mexico or to wherever you go, and if you can figure out how to Uber, how to Goober, and how to Airbnb, if you can figure out all that stuff, listen, you can figure out how to get into God's word. I think a lot of you have given up, but you haven't even tried. And you're wondering why you're gimping along. You need to get into God's word. This is the substance by which we get our fuel to make it down the road in our journey in Christianity. And then you pray. What is prayer? It's you talking to God. You just, you get alone. For me, I, I usually get alone and I get on my face. I learned this from the Muslims. That when you pray to Allah as an Islam, you, you put your forehead on the floor out of reverence. And I learned from them that, that how dare I posture myself in a place of, 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 of pride. But for me, I humble myself and I put my face on the ground because they show more reverence for a false God than the majority of Christians show for the true and living God. And so I put my face on the ground and then I begin to think about God's goodness and his characteristics and his greatness. And I begin to stir inside of my mind and inside of my heart this worship of him. And then I make my, no, my request known to him. And I speak to him in an intimate voice as if I'm talking to my bride in our bedroom. And I speak to him in an intimate voice as if my child is sitting on my lap at my dining table and talking to her daddy. And this is what it means to refuel your life that you need to siphon the sin out of your life if you're gonna live a life of sacrifice, but then you need to fill your heart with the things that bless the heart of God. Listen, God is after your heart. He's after you. And when you give your life over to him, he is a trustworthy God. So give him your bad fuel and allow him to fill you up with his greatness. 
I love that Jesus promises this woman in John chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. He answered her, and he says this about himself. He says, whoever drinks of this water, referring to himself, will, excuse me, referring to the well, will thirst again. But he turns it to him. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That Jesus is saying, I want to satisfy and gratify all of your eternal longings. And listen, I can. And that worship is the fuel for the revolution. And when you savor God and you're living a life of sacrifice for God, it gives substance to the song that you raise up to God. Point number three, if you're taking notes, finally tonight, write this down. Worship is singing. Worship is singing. Revolutions have always been marked by songs, right? Like, like, like you look at these great movements, there's typically like a national anthem tied to them, or there's typically some sort of a, a song that just rallies the cause and rallies the people around the cause. And, and listen, this is how we were made. Like we were made to, to come and unite with one another and raise our voices and find strength in that. Songs, they are powerful things. Like y'all, y'all didn't leave last week, if you were here last week, y'all didn't leave singing my sermon, Right? The crux of the revolution, the crawl of the re- no. Y'all were singing psycho, him is psycho, whatever. I don't, I'm, I'm, just singing, I'm not going to sing it for you, okay? Um, y- y'all, y'all were singing cycles, or y'all were singing the song. That the songs allow us to take the message of God with us. And worship is clearly seen in singing. We see it all throughout the scriptures. Uh, David, he's probably the greatest example of someone that was just so fixed on singing. And so all over the Psalms and all over the life of David, he's talking about singing. Skylar read one of the, a great psalm earlier tonight in our worship set about singing. And here's what David says, Psalm 33, 3. He says, sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. We find Jesus in the Gospels. He's singing on the night before he's crucified. He's with his guys in Mark 14, 26. That, that it says this, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Paul, the greatest theologian in Christianity, he's locked up with his boy Silas. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas, while in prison, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Nature, God tells us, nature sings songs to him. In Psalm 96, 11 through 12, it says, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. And in our heritage as a church, the people of God have always sung the songs of God. Martin Luther, one of the greatest Christians in history, he he said this, I truly desire that all Christians would love and regard as worthy the lovely gift of music, which is a precious, worthy, worthy, and costly treasure given to mankind. So if David in the Old Testament is singing, if Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, is singing songs to God, if Paul, the greatest theologian in Christianity, is singing songs to God, if nature is crying out in song to God, if men and women of old are singing to God, why aren't you? Where is your song paradigm? When will we come into this place and raise our voices and not care how we sound, but find strength in our song and join the annals and the heritage that we've been given? I wonder if you tragically maybe had cancer in your vocal folds and you were no longer allowed to talk or sing, would that even change the way you worship Jesus? One of the men that serves faithfully in our ministry, tragically, he had cancer across his vocal folds and he had to have them removed. And and I talked with Don earlier this week and I said, hey, what has it meant in your relationship with God to not be able to worship him through song anymore? And he said, well, when I could sing, I always sang louder than I probably should have. I sang in the same tone that I would use to call the cattle. He said, I guess that it gave people courage around me to sing louder or they just were trying to cover up my voice. He said, I've always enjoyed hearing the songs of other people. And and he said that that I I still have the chance to enter into that time of worship when I hear others crying out with passion and with volume their love of Jesus. 
He said, but sadly, I don't hear that a whole lot anymore. And I feel like the vacuum has to be filled with, with synthetic volume or amplified volume. And he said, it would be so pleasurable to me and I would be able to worship if I could hear the songs of those around me. And what he's saying is that, that we need to raise our voices, that we need to sing loud, that revolutionaries, they sing to Jesus. They raise their voice paradigm. They find strength in their song because they're living a life weekly of savoring him and sacrificing for him. And so it gives substance and meaning to their song and it gives us strength as we come together. We know how to sing. Like every one of us has got an EP that could drop. We all sing as shower singers, car singers. We got it, right? We're on iTunes, Apple Music, Spotify, uh, Napster. Just kidding, we don't have Napster, but you know what I'm saying. We got it all. I, I wonder if you had an EP, if somebody recorded an album of you singing over the last month, would there be any lines about Jesus? Or would it just be T. Sweezy? Or would it be your rap? Or would it be your, your country? I wonder, when, when you are in times of despair, where do you, what songs do you run to? Country music? Please don't do that, all right? It's going to make it worse, okay? All right? Like, like when you are in times of heartbreak, do you run, you run to Kanye? I mean, who do you run to? In the time when your heart breaks, what songs do you run to? And, and in the times that you celebrate, what songs do you run to? And the songs that you run to oftentimes speak into what you love the most. And so we know how to sing, but let us rally our song around the love of Jesus Christ. Worship is the fuel for the revolution. So I always thought it was weird that day um, that my dad wanted to save the gas. My, my dad, again, he was one of those guys that always saved everything. He was, he was a hoarder of sorts, and, and everything was worth money, right? Hey, that, that tool's worth money. That thing's worth money. You know, I'm like, we'll sell it, man, right? And so I wasn't so surprised that he, he saved the gas. But as I was thinking about that story and, and thinking about the gospel and this narrative that we operate within here, and when it, when it comes to us uh, thinking about redemption and the gospel and purpose, I begin to think about this truth that, that when it comes to Christ, nothing is wasted that my dad wanted to save that gas, even though it was undermining the performance of his truck, he wanted to save that gas because he didn't want to waste that gas. And when it comes to the gospel, you need to understand that God does a similar thing in our life. Listen, he wants to siphon the sin out of your life, but he wants to leverage your weakness to connect others to him, and he wants to leverage your weakness to connect others to you that people will be impressed by how you worship, they'll be impressed by the Bible verses you know, but they will connect with you through what has been siphoned out of your heart. They'll connect with you through your weakness, and God can use your mess. He can use your brokenness, and in somehow and in some way, in only a way that God can, He can leverage that for ministry. And listen, Paradigm, the leaders here and the people that have been coming here, is, it, Paradigm is full of people, full of men and women who once filled their life with the wrong fuel, but God changed them. And now He is using them and He's given them a heart for people who are fueling their hearts with the wrong fuel. That the gospel says, you come to me. Jesus said that day to that woman that, that he was the savior. And what that means is that he wants to take your bad, messed up fuel. And he wants to give you something different. He wants to save you from your sin. He wants to take your life and give you his righteousness. That the way Jesus saved you, the way he fulfilled being the Messiah was that he died on a cross so that you and I didn't have to stay broke down, gipping along, rolling on E every day. And he rose from the grave to give you victory. And so he is worthy of our worship paradigm. And if we're gonna be a revolution that rises up and pushes back the darkness that is invading our nation and our world, we need an anthem revolution. Well, I mean, we need an anthem paradigm. We need an anthem of adoration. We need to be revolutionaries that rise up and raise our song of worship to his praise and to his glories and to his graces because he's worthy. So let us be people who have been changed by Jesus. 
and raise our song to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I don't want to let our worship decline to the performance of mere duty. God, I don't want to let the childlike awe and wonder get choked out by unbiblical views of virtue. God, help us not to let the scenery and poetry and music of your relationship, of our relationship with you shrivel up and die. Lord Jesus, you have the capacities for joy that are scarcely imaginable. God, we were made for the enjoyment of you and help us to understand that. Help us to awaken to these glorious realities no matter how long we've lain asleep. Help us to know it's not too late. God, I pray that you would quicken your power in this place, that you would open eyes for your glory, that we would understand it's all about you, God. That we would join the heavens that declare the glory of you that we would join the skies that proclaim your handiwork. And God, when we get a greater glimpse of your glory and we begin to conjure up worship inside of our heart and adoration for you, that you would step in and change us in only a way you can. In Christ's name, amen.